Right, uh, live streaming on Zoom. Yes. <laughs> oh, what happened here? Uh, it's created this thing. I have to go to and get it into the right place. Am I not? Appearance. Uh, jump to next page now. Is it here? In appearance that I get the mirror thing? Oh, displays. Displays. Where is this place? Here. There we go. Uh, Arrange. Arrange, yes. Uh, no. No. Uh, arrange. Why is that showing? That has nothing to do with that. No. Nobody has a thing that says mirror and yeah. Yeah, that's it's it's a range. You can you don't have like I think you drag one onto the other. No, that's just the side that you put the two. It's not connected on that. We were a second ago, so I just opened a new file and Go to um yeah okay. yeah open this Uh, here we go. Jesus, what's in it? Let me get more people. So only one got in. Okay. And let's get the presentation. Let's see if the equations are there. Okay, I open it up both. So, but let's see if the equations are here. If they're here, we're fine. Because here you'll have the time. I mean, I like this because you'll have the time. Okay. This one's no, they're okay. Okay, yeah. back from no, just a little bit, but it's okay. 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 Yes, I know that so far we're without power, but it should be fine. Oh, here we go. Yes. Don't go there. Well, oh, that's know, good. But she wanted one with it. See, uh, yes. See, so I got, well, I got she's she mailed it to me. That's oh, fine. Okay. So it's open here. Yeah, Thank right. you. Thank no you. <laughs> Yeah, we yeah. Got and yet we're right. Yeah, they they got everything. Okay. Okay. Yes. Finally. Okay. <laughs> I'll have a short introduction. So a couple of things. That that's... Okay. 
é Mac, é o Flipper para o Mac. É. Raramente tem coisa agora que eu não use mais o Mac, porque inclusive o e-view, que é um lugar que eu faço de vez em quando alguma coisa, okay. já tem. Eu decidi que... Já estava, mas eu já, o meu pessoal era, agora esse é o da universidade, eu uso os dois. Very nice, Brazilian, but I didn't understand the word. <laughs> It sounds very nice. Computer, if you're talking about why I switch completely to Max. Nothing. Yeah. So how is Franklin? Okay. Well, I think that's the So everybody look here and the same. I think they asked me the question. <laughs> no, no, we ask you. We ask you. <laughs> But don't say anything. <laughs> So I said no. no. <laughs> I would say it's yes, yes, exactly. Can you say hello to the whole the whole Brazilian team? And also I wanted to discuss with uh, my target here today is things about inflation. I think the last paper they made is very clarifying, but they still I still That's don't like it. this idea. No, I don't like, I don't know how that could be for most, but I, I don't think it makes much sense to talk about the target for, for firms. Why it makes sense for workers because they have a target in terms of minimum standards. You know? And they start from a benchmark, which is the usual minimum standard. That profit, I mean, as much, they just want as much as they can. So they will resist, increase, Increases in wages anyway, and anyway, if they can. In terms of resisting <laughs> increasing in nominal wages, then if nominal demands are strong, demand is strong, etc., then we could be forced to, to give the nominal wage increase, and then they will try to push through as much as they can. Unless, I mean, yes, unless productivity increases. But uh, I think we should think about this uh, idea of terms having a target in terms of the profit rate and the well, Because either you anchor it to the interest rate plus risk, and that in that sense competition uh, forces them not to to go. I mean, much. I mean, there is a benchmark. Yeah. But uh, otherwise. Uh, we, I think we should think about that very carefully. Yes, this paper. It's very. Yeah, it's very Not this year because I'm going to the U.S. again in the spring. I organized. I have organized it for this limited. Uh, so it's all not too much trouble. I mean, I'm, I'm getting bored. <laughs> not, not the child. <laughs> And uh, but why not next year? Maybe, uh, the problem is also that we don't get much money. The painful. So I do this and I share. Can I share? Yeah, like what after you five hundred euros per year. per year, so you have to extract everything from that. Okay. But what I will see, I think I can use. Uh, okay. I mean, having nice students, um, we, I mean, there's a bunch of young. Thank you, everyone, for doing this. It's much appreciated. That's very nice, but it's not nice that you can't.
for the moment, I attend for the new there are a few resources in the department and uh, everyone wants to be, I mean, they're all against us, basically. <laughs> we don't seem to be able to cover Evan, one slice of resources. Uh, Steve, to our, can you our... get into the Zoom meeting too? ¿Qué tal, Ignacio? Hola, Matías. ¿Todo bien? ¿Todo bien? Get into the Zoom meeting. Get into the Zoom meeting. Let's, yes, because I'm trying to... Let's see if I can also. If I can join here, I'm fine because I don't want to bother Antonella uh, as she gives the talk, getting people in. Why is it up?
Can you guys hear over here? Good. Can you all hear me there in the uh, in Zoom now? Yes, yes I do. Yes, okay. I do. Sorry, I running into a bit of a. We're we're gonna wait another uh, four minutes. Twelve forty will be even ten minutes late, and and that would be fine. And I finally sorted out the. Zoom thing that I can admit people and use the phone to do that and have uh, Antonella do. Uh, so I'm going to share the screen here so that you guys can see the presentation. Uh, and hopefully everybody can. Um, I'm going to minimize it here so that Antonella doesn't see all of that. So that's where we are. Uh, Okay. Shall we start? I mean, I think we have everybody in the uh, in Zoom getting in, and I can again now sort this out uh, with the telephone. Um, so, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, you know, uh, this is our seventh uh, Godly Tobin uh, lecture. I'm going to uh, briefly, very briefly, give you a, a little story of uh, why we do a godly Tobin uh, and, and of what we did uh, so far, and then present our speaker uh, you know, uh, this afternoon, uh, Antonella Stirati, Professor Antonella Stirati uh, from Roma 3. As you can see, that he's going to talk about uh, Beyond the Navy. So uh, the, the journal, you know, this is organized by the Review of Keynesian Economics. Uh, we have almost all of the, uh, you know, godly Tobins. We were uh, lucky that the Eastern Economic Association has been uh, very nice in, uh, you know, co-hosting this and allow us to host uh, the conference, uh, uh, the the lecture uh, at their conference. We don't have a, a conference, so there is no association of Keynesian Economics associated to our journal. Uh, the idea of the journal came uh, uh, in conversations with the. Uh, you know, Professor Rifri Prochon, that it's not here, and 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 Professor Thomas Pally, uh, who also uh, couldn't make it. Uh, and it was, you know, uh, 
perhaps a result of the uh, 2008-9 uh, sort of recession and the idea that uh, Keynesian policies, effectively Keynesian policies, if you think Keynesian policies in the recessions, you know, that went more or less from, you know, the, the Reagan recession in which in a weird way there was fiscal policy, fiscal policy sort of vanished as a as an instrument of, of uh, macroeconomic policies. And in a sense, at least that sort of vague uh, Keynesianism had, had sort of gone out the window. And I think that with Obama and you know the the fiscal package there, uh, it was brought back. There was all of those books that came out on the return of Keynesian economics, the return of the masters, and so on and so forth. I should say, Professor Skidelsky is on the board of uh, of uh, Rock, and and so the idea was to uh, rethink a little bit uh, that old consensus that you know of the golden age era that in a sense in the intellectual arena was some sort of consensus a conflictive and not easy sort of uh, relationship between the cambridge uh, you know uh, keynesians the cambridge england sort of uh, you know more radical more heterodox keynesians and the neoclassical synthesis keynesians at mit and that uh, the parallel, if you want, of the breakdown of the social relations that you know underpin the golden age was the breakdown on an intellectual level with the capital debates of the uh, underlying Keynesian consensus. You know, again, held with duct tape, you know, consensus, but you know, nonetheless, uh, a consensus. So Roque was cultural project in that sense, and you know, it's not that none of the three you know editors need you know. Roshan or Pale thought that uh, you know we could bring back that kind of uh, relationship, but the idea was that the times were ripe for a new sort of uh, uh, broad Keynesian sort of understanding, and we have sort of I should say we have been quite successful in bringing uh, some mainstream new Keynesians uh, to publish uh, in the journal, more than a few. And the next step on that was the idea of the the godly Tobin. So godly and Tobin, I, I always say it could have been Samuelson and and and, uh, and John Robinson. And probably people would have related more to that. But you know there were connections in you know uh, within the journal with both Win Godley. I had worked with Win and and Tom had been a student of Tobin. And also Godley and, and Tobin had a particular sort of interesting story to the you know beginning and the name of the journal. So. Uh, Tobin came to the new school in the early, in the late 90s, and gave a talk in which he referred to himself as a, a, a non-hyphenated uh, Keynesian. And at the time I was working with Wynne and I told him that, you know, uh, that uh, he, he said that he was a non-hyphenated Keynesian and, and Wynne said that, that that's uh, the way he felt too, that, you know, that uh, he was a non-hyphenated, you know, um, uh, Keynesian. And and the journal is a non-hyphenated, uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of Keynesian journal. I only just to bother with Philippe. I normally say it's you know, but non-hyphenated is hyphenated. There's a whole debate of whether post-Keynesian is hyphenated or not, but I'll leave that to the experts on hyphenation. <laughs> and the point is that you know, it, it, the the two authors represented at least intention of dialogue. So we don't want to have a consensus in the sense we all will agree, but there is an intention of dialogue and a dialogue that departs from the notion that effective men and Cajun ideas are necessary, not just for, you know, reasonable public policy, but for the understanding of how capitalist economies actually do work. And so so that's the origin of of, uh, of this lecture. So I'm, I'm very happy, you know, part of how we build these lectures is that we brought as is in the spirit of this, people that are more on the mainstream Tobin side, and and also people that uh, are you know more on the heterodox uh, godly side. So we're very lucky to have uh, you know Professor uh, Antonio Stirati. She is a professor at Roma Tre. She is uh, you know she has a, a, a PhD uh, from uh, La Sapienza in Roma that she did with uh, Professor Garignani. Uh, she uh, has a master's from from University of Cambridge, and 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 she is from you know uh, her alma mater is the University of Siena, and and she has written extensively on on the issues that she's going to talk today to us on on you know the macroeconomics uh, of of uh, you know, conflict and and inflation and 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 uh, but the important thing I think is it's. Uh, 
that she has a deeper connection in, in some sense that uh, uh, the previous sort of speakers in, in this lecture series with uh, with the old Cambridge, uh, I mean, exception to Robert Rothern, I should say that yeah, uh, gave the second lecture, if I'm not uh, wrong. The first was Jamie Galbraith, uh, and the second, I think it was Robert Rothern. So uh, uh, Jamie too has, a, 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 I should say, a Cambridge connection, but, uh, but uh, um, <clears throat> Professor Sedari, you know, has also connection with uh, another tradition that it's associated to that, the, the long tradition of Italian Cambridge economists that links it to directly to Piero Sraffa and 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 uh, with classical political economy. So so uh, here is an attempt to bring classical political economy and, and Keynesian economics uh, together. So I as always, you know, talk too much, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm, as, as they say, open to the monologue, so that's probably not a good idea. So I'll shut up and I'll leave you with uh, Professor Stirati. Thank you. <laughs> what did I tell? I don't know. Well, hopefully, I can. Maybe just that. Hopefully, yes. Uh, something is there because I can see the. It will be this. Can you call the person outside? Because I. Yeah, uh, oh. so it's ah, there it is. It's okay. it's just a it's a finicky, very, very delicate, very finicky connection. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> we are all very fragile these days. Okay, so thank you very much to the Review of Keynesian Economics for inviting me to give this lecture. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, INET, who funded a large part of the research that I will present today. And um, also, I would like to apologize with all of you, since uh, the literature on the topic I chose is very wide. Many people have contributed. Okay. Many people have contributed, including people who might be here, and I will not be able to cover all the literature on the on the topic. Uh, so I apologize about that. I will just present my own work, ideas, and publications, often with co-authors around this subject in the last uh, years. And also, of course, mention also some other literature, but without any pretense of, of, of completeness. Um, so the points, sorry. Okay. The points uh, I will touch will be about the NIRU, the definitions, its analytical and empirical flows, and a critical assessment of the discussion around the so-called hysteresis and how it has been interpreted as upward shifts in the NERU rather than, I would say, undermining the whole idea of the NERU as such. And then I will present alternative views uh, concerning the persistent effects of aggregate demand and conflicting claims uh, inflation as the basis for a return to the old Phillips curve, that is to say a downward sloping long run Phillips curve, highly unlinear, as it used to be regarded. Uh, I will also comment on some heterodox uh, contributions that uh, incorporate the idea of acceleration uh, and briefly uh, critically comment on this say a little bit, just a little bit about policy implications of what of this alternative view I try to present. And just at the end, I will say how in my view, what I will say relates to the works of Godley and Tommy. So as you all know, there are some macroeconomic, I will not go into the microeconomics of the NIRO. So the macroeconomic features of the NIRO is that it's the only unemployment rate at which, given the institutional get up, a uh, setup, inflation. Uh, can you 
what happened here? Uh, when, when that happens, just click on the, on the it, it's... Oh, okay, sorry. Sorry. Um, it's an attractor, so it's a, an, a, it's an only unemployment rate at which inflation is stable. It is an attractor for actual unemployment, either through endogenous market mechanism, today not very uh, supported, even in mainstream literature, I think, but also other, alternatively through fine tuning of monetary policy, appropriate monetary policy. And this NIRO is determined independently of aggregate demand by the structure and institutions of the economy. These are the macroeconomic features. So each one of these features have been questioned, even in mainstream literature, I would say out of the mere force of facts, which do not very well agree with the accelerationist model. However, the concept of an IRO and of the vertical Phillips curve still plays a very important role in policy making, particularly so in the Eurozone, because it enters the definition of the fiscal rules for all the countries belonging to the Eurozone. That is, public budgets must be in equilibrium or even in surplus, if the debt is already high, uh, when unemployment, actual unemployment rate equals the narrow and then uh, GDP is supposed to be at its potential. And it is so, still is so, continues to be so, even despite uh, the evidence uh, about the impossibility to provide sensible and consistent estimates of the NIRO, which are independent of actual unemployment rates. And I would like to give you an extreme example, if you wish. These are different estimates of past, present, and projected NIROs at different times. Beginning the lowest uh, line is 2007, then there is the Great Recession, and then as you see the estimates of the NIRO go up, reaching 27% together with the actual unemployment rate, which is the dotted line. This is Spain. 27% seemed a bit too much even to the European Commission, so they decided to revise the method of estimation of the NIRO, which brought it to 20% at the end of the period instead of 27%. Still 20% is three times as big as it used to be in 2007. So there is something that doesn't work very well. Um, but the question is, is just an estimation issue. Because if there isn't such a thing as an, an, uh, an arrow, then it's impossible, it's not only non-observable, non but also non-existent, then there is no estimation that can correctly figure it out. So uh, it cannot be correctly estimated. There have been also many puzzles about this acceleration model. For example, high European unemployment in the 80s and 90s with no accelerating deflation, the long Clinton boom with no accelerating inflation, and then the missing deflation again in the US and other countries after 2008. All these macroeconomic trends uh, are not uh, in agreement at first sight, at least, with the accelerationist model. Of course, there have been papers we have, that have tried to explain how this could be consistent in somehow with that model, the facts and the model. But again, it's not a first sight evidence. In addition, I would add, from at least from an European perspective, that uh, there has been a widespread weakening of pro-labor institutions everywhere in Europe in different degrees, but everywhere since the 80s. And yet the average unemployment rate, the observed unemployment rate has increased and remained quite high all over the period. Uh, whereas according to the model, the NIRO should have declined and that's, and that's also average unemployment should have declined. These are the data for unemployment. Average unemployment rate in the Eurozone is the dotted line. Past grow in the last part of the 70s and then remains oscillation, but remains between 8% and 12%, despite the decline in the wage share, which is the... Uh, dark black line. 
So further evidence uh, undermining the notion of the narrow as an independent determinant tractor and also as an inflationary barrier has been provided by the empirical literature concerning hysteresis, which has experienced the a, a concept that has experienced the revival after the 2008. Many empirical works have shown that the persistence or permanence rather of negative effects of recessions on GDP and unemployment is a quite pervasive feature across countries and over time, independently of the initial cause of the recession. So it's just it's not just after 2008 and it's not just in case of financial crisis, but it's a general a quite widespread phenomenon. This is what has come, has come out of these uh, empirical works, even done by mainstream economists. Most of these works, however, have dealt with the effects, the impact of recession, and only a few papers have also studied the impact of expansions, on which I will come back later. So this hysteresis model and the whole concept uh, feature quite a high degree of asymmetry in the sense that it's nowadays widely acknowledged that the narrow is affected by changes in aggregate demand, particularly by recession. And then as a consequence of recession, not only actual employment will increase, but also the narrow will increase. But this is, is read, is regarded as a new inflationary value. So if the then policy, macroeconomic policy attempts to expand the economy again, that will be inflationary. So the effect will be on the rate of inflation or even accelerating inflation and not a decrease in actual unemployment and denial. So some contributions to this hysteresis literature has, have even concluded that because of this non-independence of the NIRU on aggregate demand, policy, macroeconomic policy should be even stricter because after a recession, you shouldn't try to reach the, you know, to expand the economy so as to reach the previous output and, and employment level because this would be inflationary. The NIRU has increased. This is not a generalized conclusion, but is quite uh, widespread in this literature. So what would be the causes of this asymmetry? Why would the Nairo increase so the inflationary barrier shift up after a recession? For a long time, the explanation has been based on labor market rigidity, labor market institutions, and so on. Now, again, as a consequence of the force of fact, again, uh, this view is not, uh, um, not supported very much, even by the initial proposal of this view. So what, uh, what is currently become more popular is inter an interpretation of the cause of hysteresis and also this asymmetry. Hysteresis is understood as a shift upwards of the narrow and the inflationary barrier is that long-term unemployment is created in a recession in, and it is largely irreversible. Um, so long-term unemployed are not cannot be rehired easily, and also they are not exerting an, a pressure on wages, a downward pressure on wages of the same intensity as the short-term uh, unemployed. And so attempts to expand the economy, reabsorb these long-term unemployed would be would turn out to be inflation. Actually, again, this does not is not very consistent with uh, observation with facts. Already in ninety nine, Ball had produced an interesting empirical uh, analysis showing that this is not the case. Unemployment, long term unemployment, could be reabsorbed uh, with expansions of the economy with, at the cost, let's say, of uh, some inflation, but just a transitory burst of inflation. In a recent paper I co-authored co with uh, Patrende Simeroni and Romagnello, we discussed this issue at length, and we found uh, adverse evidence to this uh, idea that long-term unemployment causes hysteresis. Particularly, we found that long-term unemployment and total unemployment move exactly in the same way, both, no, but 
what, what did I have to do? I don't remember. Uh, oh. No, this is the idea. Okay. Yeah, what, just put it to the side. This this one? Yeah. Okay. Um, so they move in the same way, both in boost and uh, and recession. And also, we with, with the method of long-term projection, we found that there is there are um, if an ex episodes of strong reduction in long-term unemployment do not generate uh, inflation, just a small increase in inflation, uh, often transitory, and this occurs even in all those cases where this strong reduction in long-term unemployment occur when, according to OECD estimates, the economy was already overheating, that is, the unemployment rate was below the estimated nail. So this okay. idea that long-term unemployment is creates an inflationary barrier is not uh, very sound. Also, a recent paper by uh, one of my co-authors, Romagnello, shows that the uh, coefficient on nominal wage growth of a Phillips curve in, in which it distinguishes between uh, long-term unemployed and short-term unemployed shows that the coefficients are not very different, are, are, are not statistically uh, significantly different. So uh, even the idea that they exert a lower pressure on, on nominal wages is not very sound. In addition to what I just said, uh, there are papers that have shown that there are uh, persistent or permanent effects on GDP and employment and unemployment also if there are expansions in aggregate demand rather than contractions and recessions. And particularly in a paper, uh, in a paper, go to a paper, we provided evidence that uh, expansions of autonomous components of demand, that is uh, government spending plus export, of a size that uh, initially about 5% increase and then became three and a half over the 10 years windows, window we analyzed for a panel of OECD uh, economists, we found that this, is a this has a persistent effect on uh, uh, on GDP, the, the first square on, on the left, uh, as a very small effect on inflation, just 0.5 uh, on inflation, also somewhat imprecisely estimated. It, is a persist it has a persistent effect.